Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this time that we can spend together studying your word and studying what you have in store for us, Lord. Continue to, to lead us and guide us in your word and your way and, and just illuminate to us what you have planned for us. In your holy and righteous name we pray. Welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I meant just enjoying it. Oh, yeah. It's okay. So, in this section, we see that Paul starts with a command. He, he goes, he kind of transitions here um, from his missionary report to something completely different. Um, and some people think this word finally is meant to signify either some sort of transition. Some people believe this could be either the ending of a passage because um, he uses the word finally, like this could be the end of the book. And then maybe he's starting another letter or this could actually be the beginning of a letter and finally is either mistranslated or is added later um, because this is completely not completely off topic, but it is kind of a shift in topic from where he was kind of to where he's going. However, we still want to treat this as one book. So the word finally is really just, um, I don't really know why he puts it in. And the commentators can't really decide other than it's kind of just a transition. So his command is to rejoice in the Lord. And it's something we've seen similar things to so far in this book of Philippians. We know that that's kind of the tone of this book. Is we talk about rejoicing and being joyous and, and the purpose for our joy, which is, which is Christ. But he finally comes out and kind of gives them this command to rejoice in the Lord. And this isn't meant to be like a one-time sort of command. This is supposed to be kind of an ongoing you weren't supposed to rejoice in the Lord once. You should always be rejoicing in the Lord. So the next phrase here, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Seems a little confusing. Anybody have any thoughts on that before we dive into that? It seems a little weird that he would write something here. Dennis? Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, neither so do I. <laughs> David, the question is, is the what are, what are the same thing you're talking about? It's going to be what he's already talking about rejoicing, which just makes sense for especially for church where they're under social and pressure. Sure. Suffering or on the verge of suffering, lot rejoicing, pervading the finding that it's worthwhile. You have something that's worth suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's about that pitch stronger. Building. Mm -hmm. That is uh, no. Go ahead. Here, here, here. Uh, strikes me that it's not. I know uh, it means of protection in a way. That he, but um, 
keeping your attitude in an attitude of this, where it says in and knowing crisis, yes, wonderful that's right of knowing crisis. Mm -hmm. That is a protection for us. It, it guards our mind and heart. That's what I. That's what it strikes me as, and it will always do so. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is kind of feels emphatic mm -hmm. to me. That is, um, you can always trust it. That's it. You can always. So there's a couple thoughts here on uh, there's a couple thoughts here on what it could mean. Uh, I think Dennis is on agrees with one of the commentators, uh, which is that it is a reference to Paul's repeated appeals for joy, which would be a safe considered a safeguard for the church. Uh, one of the others is that he's continuing in a literary fashion uh, from what he just talked about as far as talking about Epaphroditus and one commenter thinks it's because the same things is described that because when Epaphroditus comes with the letter that they suppose he brings, that he's going to be preaching the same things that Paul wrote. But there's no, technically there's no textual evidence that Epaphroditus was commissioned to deliver the letter. That's more just a traditional belief we hold. We think he did, but we're not a hundred percent certain. Um, the final one is actually that, his words reference the same things he's talking about, reference actually what follows here in this passage. So he's right, the same thing he's right, what he's writing here, he likely has already talked to the Philippians about in some sense. That's kind of where the, what some commentators think he's doing. And he's referring to something that he's written that already, mm -hmm. something that he's already established in, 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 in the Philippians. Right. We don't, we might not see, he might be referring to something, you know, that's not seen in this letter whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, and joy and and watching out for false teachers are connected because the false teacher that that he's speaking of in this in the following verses I might be speaking about. No, no. Um, you're good. Uh, the following the te the false teachers that he's talking about in the following sentences are those who would rob the church of their joy of what who of what they already have in Christ um, uh, by telling them you don't have Christ yet because you're not. This, that, or the other. You're not circumcised. You're not uh, uh, completed. Uh, you're not uh, converted over to Judaism, um, which is the method of the of, of really the people who were following Paul and went to all of Paul's established churches and would say, "Well, Paul told you this. He gave you the easy stuff, but now we're going to tell you the real truth. The real truth is you have to be circumcised." Blah, blah, blah. And so. Um, Paul is, is warning them of that. And at, least, at least this is what I think. Um, that Paul is warning them of that. And the joy is connected with that because what they have in Christ, what Christ has already done for them, uh, they, can, they don't have to have more. Not like they're missing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And two, Paul is, so he says, for me, it's no trouble. It's, it's not a bother to Paul to continue to write these things, right? So I, he writes about the, the Judaizers we'll talk about and these warnings of false teachers. But to him, it's not a bother. Does, he's trying to tell them it's not a burden. He'd rather repeat this for their sake, right? And so it's not just being safe. It's um, also kind of translated as like a safeguard, kind of like a safety net. So you know, like basically, I'd rather repeat this to you to be more cautious, right? If I only said this once and you fell into the trap of the false teachers then maybe I, he would feel some sort of way about maybe I didn't do enough to preach to them, but I'm going to repeat this to you to, for your protection, basically. They were, in Paul's view, potentially, is they were in grave danger from these heretics, and they needed this serious warning. Yes. I, my translation says, anyone who gets tired of telling you that he's going to do it, it's mm -hmm. What translation is that? Okay. So the heretics that we're going to discuss here in the next passage or so, or next verse or two, are traditionally seen as Judaizers, which I'm sure you've heard about before, having gone through Galatians. Um, if you don't remember what Brian probably taught, I'm sure, about the Judaizers, um, they were a group that felt that even though the Gentiles were being converted, they should still hold themselves to like Mosaic law. 
So they should follow the Torah. They should get circumcised. They should have all the outward signs of Jews, basically. They should become Jews. It's basically kind of what he's saying. They should become Christ-bearing Jews. Um, and that in and of itself is not fairly a bad thing, per se, but they viewed it more as if you didn't do those things, then you really couldn't have salvation. I, I have a thought that Paul felt that Judaizers were interfering with the true belief that trying to become a Jew interfered with becoming a true Christian. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So basically your requirement for salvation was you had to get circumcised. You had to follow Mosaic law. That was like a requirement for salvation, which is very counter to what Paul taught. Um, it's also not, it would not have been a surprise that these Judaizers, though they were obviously in Galatia, would have not, would have been also widespread, right? Christianity spread throughout the land, the Asia Minor, the Middle East, into Europe. And this group also probably, we believe, I think, came from Jerusalem and then kind of also spread itself out where they would send their own emissaries to different churches to preach basically their version of what they call the gospel which is not really the gospel. But you can almost understand where because Jesus was Jewish came to the Jews. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, so did Peter. And, mm -hmm. and so did Peter. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. And I won't go into that, but... but. <laughs> I have a thing that I um, that is that being mostly Gentile in a Gentile city. One of the things that they, that everybody was subject to was a requirement that you hear something like that you had to go and sacrifice to you for about three drops of wine on the Altar of whatever it was. Nominal thing. And acknowledge Caesar. And on one hand, that was like a proof of royalty, of citizenship. This thing is kind of like a little bit like, uh, I always had to play the Pledge of Allegiance flag every day in public school, you know. So it's a little bit like that. But it also has a religious connotation. To it. And the only people that were exempt from having to do that every year were Jews. Fought long enough and hard enough that they decided it wasn't worth trying to beat them. So they were allowed to sacrifice for the on behalf of the emperor rather than sacrifice to the emperor. So if a Christian Gentile became a Jew, they, they had to get out of jail free card. They don't have to do that anymore. So it, it, it would be a way to dodge some of the legal social pressure that they were under. Fortunately, as Paul points out, that also means that you're getting involved in saying, well, that Christ is not enough for you. Not just going under the Jewish law, but also facing pagan So this could be another reason why you might be tempted to do it if you're a Gentile convict. Mm -hmm. Not just if you think, you yeah, know, the Jews really have it right. But if you say I'm a Jew, I don't have to worry, go and worry about being uh, thrown in jail for not saying Caesar is Lord when I say Jew. Don't know, but it's just another thought that. No, I like that. I did. I did not hear. I've not heard that before. That's actually wonderful. I and I kind of think adds to the point. Yeah, well, it, it, it's it's not the argument you see in Galatians. There, it was all uh, religious. It was mm -hmm. righteousness was based in God. But and it always, it's always going to have that. Uh, but mm -hmm. there could be some reasons you might be tempted. Yeah. Don't buy it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, so, verse two, Paul doesn't pull any punches when talking about these people. Yeah. He's very pointed. I do want to say one thing, though, especially about his use of the term dogs, is it's not as bad as it seems. It's still, it's not good, but it's not, I think some people would take some sort of, uh, down here in my notes, 
um, where he's not really being like racist or being um, like we haven't when we think we think about calling somebody if we were to call somebody a dog there's that sense of like worth that worthlessness connotation that would not have existed um, that would be it's more of a religious kind of connotation so the we'll get to it in a second but the Jews would have been seen anybody who was basically not a Jew dogs more about their religious identity they were ritually unclean not necessarily worthless so but before we get to that I want to I want to give you some interesting information that may not be I may not benefit the text a whole lot but I just love I love Paul's rhetoric and I love Paul's <laughs> wordplay I know last week I think we talked about his hyperbole um, here he uses an alliteration to prove his point um, you can't obviously you won't see that in the English because the Greek but the Greek uses it so the words for dog evildoers and those who mutilate, mutilate the flesh all begin with a K. So again, it's something you would never get in the English text, and it doesn't really do much other than it kind of just emphasizes Paul's point, which again, for me, is really cool. For you guys, may not care. <laughs> but I really, I really love his word. He really means it. I mean, he's not joking, you know, right. joking around. He wants them to remember that point. Mm -hmm. And the mutilators of the flesh, I find that a kind of a wonderful thing to say, because... Um, in the medical terms, you know, any injury or wound um, that doesn't heal will infect mm -hmm. and will, and I, I think, maybe I'm reading much more into it, than, obviously, but from that medical point of view, from that, I see he's really talking about how the evil wounds and how deep it can go and how infectious it can get. I don't know, I just, I... It couldn't be a better word picture, in my view. Mm -hmm. Before we get there, because we're going to go through each oh, of these sorry, terms. No, 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 you're fine. We are going to go through each of these terms in, in brief, just so we understand. But also remember that this letter would have not been read by most people. Most people would have heard it. So that alliteration of using those makes it also easier to remember. Right? For us, we can read it. It's easy to just read, and it's not a big deal. But they would have had. They would have more likely heard it than read it. I think would go into the preaching style. Is the Carol's found parallels in here from Psalm or Psalm twenty two is one of the I didn't hear much of the fight. First one there is my God, my God, why have you taken me? So obviously it's gonna be and when you get down to verse fifteen and uh the translation. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircled me, they pierced my, my feet. So it's the same three concepts. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he's writing using biblical language that they're familiar with already. You now, the three terms are different. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what that's what One of the about all. One of the things about Paul is that he wrote in such a way that people heard them and it, they were simple enough that they could remember the, the gist, so to speak, of what he wrote, even if they could not read and reread the way that we do. He wanted it to be simple enough to make memories. Mm -hmm. So the word for dogs would have been synonymous with something that carried a strong religious and ethnic connotation. And Paul's using it here, kind of with all three of these phrases, to convey a sense of irony. So, and we'll see this as we go along through all three of these. Um, the term is often used by Jews to refer to those of lesser status, mainly the Gentiles. They were considered to be outside of the covenant community and also ceremonially unclean. In Mark 7, Jesus draws a comparison between the Syrophoenician woman and dogs, right? And she does not take offense to this. In any way, it would have been something that was not necessarily seen as a derogatory term. Not, not necessarily. It may have been, but it wasn't necessarily seen that way. It was more just kind of another way to, to generalize a group. Um, but, all, but here, Paul's really using it to, to begin to show some irony, right? So it's now, so obviously they, as the Judaizers, feel that these new Gentile Christians are unclean. But really what Paul's calling them, right? They're the ones who, in the new covenant, are unclean. They're outside the new covenant community, right? And Paul's going to continue this with all three of these things to kind of juxtapose 
old to old covenant to new covenant beliefs. And also to sh- so to show basically that all these things that they hold on to are all right. It's interesting. I'm sorry to interrupt, no. but uh, it's interesting the contrast between self righteousness and and actual godly righteousness here. And um, the one group is appealing to one, and Paul is appealing to another. Um, and so his calling them evil doers, even while it, I mean, it goes back to the God of, of all of all scriptures who says that I hate your feet, you know, and all your your different uh, religious acts that you think justify you, um, but what, what really justifies is the blood of Christ. And um, even today, like Don has been looking at these people on Instagram, it's Instagram, right, that are uh, um, Jewish women, and they get on and post all these posts about all the different things they have to do, and it is complicated. And it is hugely uh time consuming and and uh but they love it and they're proud of it it's it's not just like this is what we have to do in order to appease god no they're proud of the fact that they do these things these rituals in order to uh uh show themselves that they're not pleasing god is like in the background it's really in order to be right in order to be righteous um and so uh, God is kind of like an afterthought. Um, God commanded these things supposedly, but but uh, well, I say supposedly because many of the things that they do are not commanded in scripture. But um, really, what what they're about is is their own rights. And I think we'll, I think I had something somewhere later in my notes, but we have to also be careful that the identity is like, especially as Paul is a Jew, would also he still was a Jew, right? He still did these things. He was circumcised. He did follow a lot of these regulations. And that's, but that was his way of worship, right? That wasn't just, oh, I'm better than you. And we'll see this in, especially in this passage. It wasn't that part of Judaism. So these things aren't necessarily inherently bad. It's because of the status that the Judaizers placed them basically above God, in, in a sense. So evildoers would not have merely mean meant sinners or people who did what is wrong. Um, based on kind of Paul's words here, it's really meant to refute their claim that they were the Judaizers were doing works of the law, right? We we know that genuine good works are only done by true believers. Judaizers were earthly minded false believers whose teaching led to the works of the flesh. So in this way too, they would have been considered spiritual Gentiles, right? He calls them evildoers because their fruit reveals their heart. And then the term mutilation of the flesh, though it could mean a couple different things, I think because of the context here, we're dealing with something that is um, circumcision. And actually, if you have an NASB, that's what it says. It says, beware of the dogs, beware of the eagle workers, beware of the false circumcision. So that's really what, so he's a few, but he, what he's doing is he's taking circumcision and equivocating it to mutilation, Right. There's a sense of irony there, right? You're circumcising them, but really what you're doing is you're just mutilating them for no for no purpose because God doesn't see this as anything worth anything. It would be important to a descendant to Jew too. That's what these guys that's what amazing um, what you and Brian both alluded to is that these guys are are following Christ and turning their whole life around and throwing the mosaic law out. Mm-hmm. And that I I can't imagine. I mean, I have to do that on a daily basis, right? Throw out the the what is not Christ, but um, I just I marvel because they throw away Phariseeism too. That's what they've been brought up, you know, mm-hmm. with or whatever teacher it is. Mm-hmm. Silva states of this too, when Jewish rituals are practiced in a spirit that contradicts the message of the gospel, these rituals lose their true significance and become no better than pagan. Paul, so Paul here is taking the identity that the, Jew, the Judaizers would have identified, teachings, it's how they lived, and he tore it down. And he's trying to show them and to show the Philippians how counter really is to the gospel, right? And then everything the Judaizers are really offering is... Completely counter to what Paul's been teaching, to what what the gospel teaches, right? 
And so after this chastisement in verse three, he turns and he kind of reaffirms uh, to the Philippians their choice and that what their continued choice should be. Now, I don't think that based on the way that this is worded, I don't think there was a lot of people who probably initially were um, swayed by the Judaizers, perhaps, but he's probably writing this because maybe he all knows of some influx and maybe there's more Judaizers coming. Maybe this movement is gaining um, steam. And so pastorally, he wants to protect them, uh, even if they none of them really go to the Judaizers. So, but here he reaffirms the Philippians and their belief in the faith, right? He says, we are the circumcision, right? Who worship God in spirit. And in truth, and that doesn't say truth, but we kind of get that sense of what Jesus says to the woman at the well, right? That the, those who worship God worship in, are to worship in spirit and in truth. And it's very remarkable to say it's kind of the same thing, right? So, but the worship of God, again, is not outward act and empty words like the Judaizers relied on, right? Their adherence to the Mosaic Code, but rather worshiping by the spirit and in the spirit and to glory in Christ. Does anybody know what it means to? glory in Christ? Because Paul said this a couple times down. They don't know what talked about it. It's to have, it's kind of to have confidence in Christ. It's not an equal translation to be the same word as confidence because Paul will say as he goes down further in this verse about having confidence in the flesh or not having confidence in the flesh. It's kind of the idea is where do I put my confidence? Where do I put do you know pride. what the Greek says? I don't know what the Greek says for, <laughs> for, for glory in Christ. It's, like is there a, there's a different Greek word for glory and then kind of, Right. Uh, the Greek word is kalkiomai. Maybe I butchered that. And then the Greek word for confidence is pepoi. It seems it would mean a much deeper thing. It probably does. Yeah. I don't think they're completely yeah. synonymous. And no. Uh, the commentaries I read would say that too. It's not completely synonymous, but we do get some of that sense that that's where Paul's kind of going. Confidence starts with glory. Right, glory is more. Yeah. Right. So in silver, so, so, uh, it's either silver or odd. It says, to believe in Christ is to put one's confidence in him. But if Jesus Christ is our grounds for confidence, he's therefore also our grounds for joyful pride and for exultant boast. They cling to Christ. They abandon their flesh. Their confidence is in Christ alone. Because confidence in the flesh subverts the gospel. So now Paul goes on to uh, one of the commentaries I was reading says, titles a section, calls it mock boasting. Mm -hmm. So Paul gives you every reason why he should be proud. We've read this. I, I've read this a couple times, especially I think we were talking about uh, in chapter one where Paul talks about how he basically counts everything, not counts everything as lost, but like his perspective is very like kingdom minded, right? He only cares about Christ being preached. He doesn't care about people afflicted. And this is very much along the same lines. He doesn't even care about his own, um, his own perspective, basically, his own upbringing, his own source of fleshly pride he could have, right? So let's go through these credentials really quickly and just kind of, because some of them are along the same lines. So he breaks them into two categories. The first few, I think it's three or four, are things he would have inherited. Things he was born into, they were nothing he had control over. And then the last uh, three would be things that he could have taken pride in because he actually himself had done. Okay? So circumcised on the eighth day is obviously what it is Mosaic Code for Jewish boys. They were circumcised on the eighth day under the law. Um, the Judaizers would say this is their outward sign that made them better than Gentiles, or Jews would have said that this made them better than Gentiles um, as an outward symbol. Um, and this is probably why Judaizers wanted the circumcision to continue, is that physical, partially, is that physical representation of being better than other people, which is kind of done away with, as we see. Like, there is no... In the Old Testament, there's a lot of outward signs, Right, they have the the command about the hair with the temples potentially, and then the circumcision. So there's all these outward signs of who the people of God are, and then in the new covenant we lose all that, right? Where there's really no outward except for the fruit that you bear. There's no like physical outward signs of you couldn't really just look at somebody without them doing anything and know that they're Christian, right? 
It's all about the heart, which is, is we see that theme a lot. Uh, then he says he's an Israelite and a Benjaminite, which again, just confirms his Jewish heritage. He was proud to be of the covenant people. Um, say was, because he's probably no longer, he's probably still some source of pride, but it's not, it is trumped by Christ. Same way with the tribe of Benjamin, there's that source of pride that the tribe of Benjamin, as we know, aligned with the tribe of Judah, which is the Davidic line, which when the kingdom of Israel split at the time after Solomon's death, Benj the tribe of Benjamin actually went with Judah. All the other tribes went to the northern kingdom. Um, the last phrase here concerning his heritage, the Hebrew of Hebrews um, is a little harder to understand. He could simply have said that he was... Hebrew through and through, and that was it. Um, one of the commentators, uh, Osborne, in his verse by verse, says this may have implied that Paul's family spoke Aramaic at home and was especially careful to maintain the dietary laws and other Jewish customs, even though they lived in Tarsus, which was outside of the Jewish home. In other words, Paul's family was among those who adamantly refused to adopt a Greco Roman lifestyle. So like, even though Paul grew up in Tarsus, was raised in Tarsus, both of his parents were Jewish. He was Jewish. Everything was Jewish through and through, no matter where they lived, no matter what they did. And that was, I think that's a solid ending point to where this is his upbringing. As far as his ethnic heritage and the things he had no control of. Um, and then he says, as to the law of Pharisee. So as at a young age, and we don't know exactly what age, Paul decided to become a Pharisee or his parents decided for him that he was going to be a Pharisee. Um, he was tutored by the rabbi Gamaliel, which you will find that record in Acts 22, verse 3. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. And then, as for zeal, a persecutor of the church. So not just a persecutor of the church, but a zealous persecutor of the church, right? Paul was, we know Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen, but Paul, this was definitely, especially in his former life, a source of pride for him. That this is what he did. He wasn't just a Pharisee. He was on the up and up, kind of. He was the one persecuting the church. He was the one leading the charge. And, and if you remember it, and on the road to Damascus, that was part of why he was on the road to Damascus, going to go to Damascus, and then probably continue to push through Asia Minor. I think and my geography is terrible, but um, to push through wherever he was going and continue past Damascus to deliver these letters and continue to persecute Christians wherever he went, right? On orders from the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, right? Paul probably thought he was doing his part in removing obstacles in the way of God's coming kingdom for the Jewish people. For his Jewish brothers. However, we know that Paul had a change of heart later. Um, this and this zealousness of persecuting the church is probably one of many reasons Paul refers to himself as the chief of sinners. Right? There's probably some other reasons there, and that, that's a whole nother debate we can talk about it when we get your story goes through. Number one. But when we get to that passage, there's a couple other connotations there as well. Why he may or may not be the chief of sinners. Um, this title, but this title only shows his strict adherence to the Jewish faith and not to, and shows also that he would have been experienced in a relationship between traditional Jews and Christ following Jews in order to weed out those he believed at the time were not of the faith, so to speak. We need to understand too, like Ed, from Paul's letters, all letters to the Galatians and what he says here too, Paul has Turn for the church and and anger at the Judaizers. It's obviously that it's obvious that he's angry. There's no way of getting around that. But it's not that he doesn't love them or care about them. We need to recognize or remember that that Paul has a burden for them. And we, in fact, we read in Romans nine that he would rather himself be cut off for the sake of the Jews, um, if that were possible. You know, so that they might be saved, that Paul could be cut off from Christ, so that they might be saved. Paul has a great burden for the Jewish people as well. So even though he doesn't, he doesn't uh, allow for that false teaching, doesn't mean he doesn't care about them. Which is the kind of message for us today, isn't it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and Paul has a huge burden for them, a huge heart for them, but he also doesn't allow for that false teaching. Yeah. 
What a lot of people get out of and I just oh, want to say this, what a lot of people get out of Paul is a sense, and part of this we I can we can blame Martin Luther for is the sense that Paul hated Pharisees. Paul was very anti-Jewish in a lot of places. But Paul was never more Jewish, it was never more proud of being Jewish from the beginning of his life to the end. He loved being a Jew, he never forsook that. He uses the old testament throughout his writings. And even still, like he he the obviously Blaise Bryan said he has a heart for the Jews. But we said he's he's doing his part to separate as best he can what is false teaching and what is could be seen as false teaching and what is traditional Jewish heritage. Because like I said, Paul never would have abandoned and never did abandon Jewish heritage. However, he was able to separate the things that took place and were basically counter to Christ or sometimes placed over Christ and put Christ at the forefront and then everything else takes place. And that's for him where everything stands. Well, even Christ, right, or more than one time, even I see that. And when he reiterates here who he sees himself as he was, there's no shame here. Mm -hmm. It's not only mocking, but people who tell, or when people can tell the truth, there's, um, you may say it for repentance or shame, but there's gladness and glory in the fact that you can't say it without shame and be glad. That's kind of what I, some of what I see here too. He, Hebrew, the Hebrews to me means he wanted to be in the forefront, man. I want to be first. Mm -hmm. And and he's telling them that. And then coming down to where he humbles himself. Just a very mm -hmm. The last phrase, and we'll blow through this one a little bit. Um, he says he's under the law, he's blameless. This would not necessarily have been understood mm -hmm. as he was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really find that anywhere in Jewish theology. Uh, rather, that his outward signs of, if people looked at him, they would have called him, right? As to the law of blameless. His heart, not so much, right? Yeah. But basically, if anybody would have, like, checked the record or something, Paul would have never been charged formally with transgressing the law. It's not something he would have never done. Um, I think that's, sorry to add on something you wanted to do quickly. Um, Nate, sorry. That's <laughs> good. I think that that yeah, got you. there's a lot more there than than uh, uh, we see at first glance, actually, because he's saying under the law blameless, and really that's that is kind of the source of conflict that we see Christ have with the Pharisees in 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 the first place is that they are under the law blameless. They consider even the word Pharisee means separated. So they consider themselves to be the blameless ones, the holy ones, the ones who are law-abiding, the ones who have it right. And But Jesus said, because you say we see, your sin remains. And so Jesus is looking for, and he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. And so he, he's looking for a different kind of righteousness that that is, that is what God is looking for is a different kind of righteousness that is not appeased by or fulfilled by uh, these human uh, regulations and rules that which they we can fulfill and sit back and go, well, I don't drunk, drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't run with those who do, so that means I'm set, good with what God wants me to be, and I can be whatever wicked, evil thing on the inside I want, um, but, but God says no, not be at all. Right. So I think there's a lot, a lot there. There is. We were going to skip all that. <laughs> it's mostly for the sake of time. But, but, but here's. Gotcha. Where he says, no difference almost in the culture of the glory of God. We usually apply that as an individual, you know, everybody's a sinner. And that's true, but in the context, there's no difference than between Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. He said, even if you're a good Jew, you sin and then fall short of the glory of God, yes. including himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it true? So, all these things Paul has, 
verse seven, he counts as law, right? Whatever gain I had, all these things, the advantage of being born Jewish, the, the fact that he studied as a Pharisee or persecuted the church, all these things he counts as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, in this verse eight, this indeed is very, very, it's a, it's a phrase, it's not a word um, that is not really has an English counterpart. And so the meaning is kind of lost. But again, this is one of those things that this indeed, you should underline, circle, highlight is super emphatic. I don't have that. I have more than that. Some yeah, it also has been translated more than that. What is more? Um, I think it, that's closer to the literal rendering of it, but it still would have been a very um, I think Silva Trent paraphrases it as let me be clearer. Right. So he says, he says, whatever gain I had, I count as loss. Let me be clearer, I count everything as lost, right? Not not parse, not little bitty things, everything is lost, right? And for this, for the simple sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So this is some people have titled the essence of Pauline the- theology, which is the centrality of Christ. Right, Paul, the center for for Paul is Christ. Everything is lost except Christ. If Paul knew nothing, but he knew Christ, and he says this in Corinthians, I desire to know nothing among you but Christ and Christ, preach Christ and Christ crucified. I can't remember if it's in Corinthians. Or not. Yeah, terrible. Yeah. But that's but he says that, right? So if you know nothing else but Christ and Christ crucified, Paul, well, that's 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 the starting point. That's enough, right? Yeah. Uh, sorry to keep on interrupting me. Um, but even in, in, in the church, we lose we lose sight of that. And I am reminded of a time where I was pulled aside after um, and I'm not trying to say that I am a paragon, right? But I was pulled aside after a, a message. And told that uh, several people were upset with the message because there's other good things in life besides Jesus, Brian. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> and the and the message was it was just that it's just is just is this that it's Christ that that it that He is to be all our all in all, and others were upset that you know that I was underselling. <laughs> everything else. Um, but isn't that what Paul is saying? I, I consider it all lost. Everything has lost compared to Christ. So it's not saying that there's no good things, right? Mm-hmm. It's saying that compared to Christ, there's no good things. <laughs> compared to Christ, everything is lost. Compared to Christ, when set up next to him, there is no comparison, you know. It's very reminiscent of what Isaiah says when he says, all our righteousness is filthy. And Paul kind of alludes to this a little bit here. So in verse 8, he'll keep going. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. So he switches from kind of nouns to verbs. He talks about loss, and then he talks about he suffers loss. And he counts things as lost, right? And this counting of all things as lost is um, rubbish is maybe not strong enough. Um, there are a lot of different thoughts on that. Commentators can't really agree. Some people would go as far as to say it's excrement. Um, some people would just use refuse or muck manure. or manure. Um, in any case, it is, it is something that is not pleasing in any way, right? And And to... To Brian's point, uh, I think this is what I said before. Here's my note on Paul about his Jewishness. Uh, Silva states, one must be careful, however, not to conclude that Paul regarded Jewishness in itself as revolting. His sense of identity with his people, as well as passages like Romans 3, verses 1 and 2, and 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, make clear that he continued to appreciate the great value of his heritage. It was therefore not the heritage as such that he revolted against but the viewing of, the, of that heritage as a human right or achievement, thus obscuring one need, one's need for a full dependence on God's grace. So gaining Christ here is what's paramount, right? Paul can still be a Jew and gain Christ. However, there's some things that have to change, right? Paul couldn't remain as he was. He couldn't be a zealous persecutor of the church and gain Christ, right? Christ trumps that. 
For I would also submit the Judaizers couldn't remain as they are and gain Christ, right? Their ideals for their treatment of Gentiles trying to become Jews gets in the way of God's grace. For them. The regulations are more important than actually having a relationship with Christ. Paul says that if, they, if you become a Judaizer, Christ will have no value to you. Mm -hmm. Right. You would, your faith would be in your circumcision, just like many, for it is for many Jews, right? And so the idea of gaining Christ, um, Martin says, the person and work of Christ are inseparably joined. To gain him is to have him as one's all prevailing merit. And in the classic words of Melanchthon, to know him in the intimacy of personal trust and surrender is to know his saving benefit. So as we start to wrap up here, verses 9 through 11, and we'll see how far we get into this too much, but there's really a sense of, and I think Silva puts it this way, and this is the way I like it to understand it best, is it really is a good description of the Christian journey. And it is such that there's three big words we could use here, um, justification in verse 9, sanctification in verse 10, and glorification in verse 11. So and I'll give you some definitions in case you're, oh. some people, because I don't know fully something. Uh, justification is a Christian's judicial acceptance by God is not guilty because his sins are not counted against him. And they are such because Christ's righteousness trumps. Them. Sanctification is the ongoing supernatural work of God to rescue justified sinners from the disease of sin and conform them to the image of his son, holy, Christ-like, and empowered to do good works. And glorification would refer to, especially time at the second coming of Christ, those who died in Christ and the living believers will be given resurrection, resurrected bodies, a final and full, basically a final and full perfection of our bodies, preparatory for and suited for the final state of Christian believers to be adequate enough to be in the presence of God, right? Because if we stayed as we are in our sinful state and we weren't glorified, we would face the fate of what God describes to Moses, even though it doesn't happen to Moses, but that's why God hide, has to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock. And he can only see God's back because if God, basically if Moses had seen God face to face, he would have perished because God is too holy for our um, So that's what, so if we go back to verse nine, it says, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty simple to see here that Paul is, is relying, again, not on his, his earthly attributes, his earthly achievements, but rather on the righteousness of Christ, because the only thing he's realized that will save him is the righteousness of Christ. Well, the thing about gaining, too, you have to forsake something else to put gain in its place. And, and you know, and to examine that and make that choice, that's a complete, or is that a complete thing? You know, um, and it, that speaks to motivations and all the things that have to be in, in a heart to be able to gain. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, it's neat that the, all those those three ideas are right in those, mm -hmm. in those three verses. Mm -hmm. um, I would say a little, I don't know what the verse says, but I would add on to that def definition of sanctification with we're not just sanctified to be something, we are sanctified to something. Um, God sanctifies his people for his purpose, there's a reason. Um, behind sanctification, not just so that you can be pure, it's so that you can be his for, not just his, it's his for. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how anything is sanctified, uh, we see in the Old Testament. It's not just, you know, this is a beautiful sanctified bowl for the, for the temple. It's not a decoration. <laughs> it's going to be used. It's going to be done. Something's going to be done with it. 
um, uh, for God's purposes, right? And so the same thing with our family. We're not decoration. God's going to use us. And Paul, oh, no, you're good. And Paul also uses here phrases like may or might, uh, that I may know him, that I may attain resurrection. It's not that Paul really is doubtful of this, because Paul speaks elsewhere that he's very confident his knowledge of what's going to happen to him, especially even earlier in Philippians. Like, hey, I'm, well, he doesn't really know what's going to happen to him, but whatever happens, God's got it. Basically, God's got it handled. Um but this really, this may attain kind of speaks to his own feebleness. So it, it's important to distinguish, I think uh, Osborne says this, um, between the firm, unmovable object of our hope, which he has faith in Christ. He knows that Christ can raise him from the dead. He knows that Christ's righteousness will cover him and our subjective apprehension. So even though Paul knows all these things and has confidence in all these things, having confidence that God can do whatever, he still realizes that he's still feeble in his faith and still feeble in his own actions. It does tries to minimize his amount of, of fleshliness in here. Hey, had he not done beforehand, he wouldn't have been able to. Mm -hmm. say, I have suffered the loss of all things that come to the rubbish. In order that, I may, may, so that that's his reason for suffering the loss and coming into rubbish. If you don't count that as useless, something to get rid of, you can't get there. Mm -hmm. It's very reminiscent of somebody's sermon. I, I still remember to this. I don't know who that is. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. He might be there. Um, but so, as in going through these commentaries, though, one commentary I find helpful in sort of an application standpoint of these, this text is uh, Spurgeon's, comment, Spurgeon's mm -hmm. commentary. His exegesis of the text and his exposition are elementary. They're pretty standard. There's nothing fan, super fancy in there. But his application is always really, really spot on. It's, it really hurts to kind of consider some of the questions he asks. I don't like it. Um, it's good for it's good for me. It doesn't mean I have to like it. It's, it's Right. Not just think, but you really have to, to soul search a little bit. Yeah. Um, you have to examine yourself. It's not the... but, he, but he asks this question. He says, have you considered all things lost for the sake of knowing Christ? Yeah. And that's not necessarily in the same way that Paul does, right? Because Paul's sense of loss is a little bit different in his like, complete 180 of, of Damascus Road. But have you submitted everything under Christ? As everything, all your highs, as Brian would put it, have you torn down your high place for Christ? Have you allowed Christ to tear down your high right. places? You can't tear them down without his help. This is also true. But has he yeah. revealed those high places to you? Do you know their high places? Do you, but do you, in your flesh, still want to hold on to them? Do you allow him to, to help you remove them? Uh, our primary goal, Paul says, is to know Christ in every area of our life and as deeply as possible. We're to be consumed not with our work or our earthly status, but with Christ alone. When we place him first, everything else falls into place, making us better workers, better bosses, better fathers and mothers, and better people. Temporary gain, earthly achievements, becomes true gain as Christ permeates every area of our lives, and transforms us in every way. But he must be first. So it's not, it's, if we go back to think about Paul and his Jewishness, it's not, Paul did wasn't required to forsake his Jewishness. He was just required to submit his Jewishness under the feet of Christ, under the authority of Christ. And in doing so, we get a very vivid picture across his letters of what that really means. But we can take that picture presented here and in other letters and apply it to our own life. That Paul had to do it with his Jewishness, right? Or Paul had to do it with some of the disputes that he had. Where do we have to do it with? Do we have to do it with our own disputes? Do we have to do it with our sources of pride at work or our sources of pride as parents or, or our academic prowess or, uh, or whatever else it might be. Like, do we submit that to the will of Christ and do we use those things that God has gifted us for, for our own gain? Or do we use the things God has gifted us for, for his gain? Right. Because God has given us all gifts. We're all very good at certain things. And the question is, what do we use them for? Right. 
and how do we use them mm -hmm. and when mm -hmm. you know I move before before it moves in I think Paul's statements and Virgin's explanation of them and encouragement for us, it, it comes from what we see in Paul's of, of Paul's relationship in this passage. It doesn't just come because Paul wants to be righteous or Paul wants to be this, that, or the other. Because above all things, and we're talking about this in the message today, so it's, it's coincidental. Um, not really coincidental. <laughs> but um, that where it comes from is a is an all-consuming desire for God. That's why we get to the place where we consider all things rubbish. That's why we get to the place where we count all things long. That's why Paul got there, and that's why we get there, because, and that's why those things come up, up in our lives where we can say that. Um, not that, you know, we're longing to throw off everything, that we're, we're you know, we're wanting the suffering. It's because we get there because we want, no matter the cost, to be where Jesus is. And Paul wants, no matter the cost, to, to be in fellowship with his Savior. And, and, that, and, and wherever that takes them is where he wants to be. And whatever that, whatever, wherever God puts his finger on in his life, Paul wants God to do God's work in him. And, and the same is for us, that like when it comes between the choice between Jesus and me, I might choose me all the time, but when I, when I have the attitude of Christ or the attitude of Paul here, uh, choosing me hurts too much because I'm not running with my Lord, not with my Jesus. And so is that where we are? You know, is 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 that where we are? That that we love the Lord so desperately that everything that competes with Him in our life, in our attitude, is garbage. You know, in our arguments with our spouse, you know, um, is Christ in the center of that? <laughs> is He in the center of that? Saying, you know, what are you choosing here? Are you choosing me or you? You know, in our in our in our relationships at work or in our neighborhoods or with anybody that in any in any difficult time, choosing Christ happens at every single moment. Every single moment, we we have to make that choice: choose Christ or hit the gas pedal and, and throw the bird at the guy who just did that to you. You know, every single moment we have that choice. No matter what that decision comes, choose Christ or choose us. Choose Christ or choose left. Choose Christ or choose self elevation and self motivation and self proclamation. Choose Christ. I don't know if I have anything to add to that. But I do want to add one thing that's a little bit along a different line. Um, just remember here, too, that we've seen so in Philippians 2, he uses Christ as the example of obedience, humility. And then he kind of transitions to I'm sending these guys to you, Timothy and Epaphroditus. They can be a road. Here, Paul's not Paul's not tooting his own horns for the sake of tooting. It's I, I think it's very clear and obvious that he counts all things as rubbish. But it's again his example of follow me as I follow Christ, right? Because again, he states even here, it's not about me. It's not about my knowledge. It's about the righteousness of, that Christ has given me. It has, it has nothing to do with me. Amen. But you can follow that example, and that's that's again his, his teaching letter, right? He wants the Philippians to. To watch out for false teachers, to to really embrace Christ as the primary of everything, as sovereign of everything, as, as everything, really. And so that's that's the gist of it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the teachings that you reveal. Thank you for continuing to work in our hearts and make us more like Christ. Thank you for taking care of us. And thank you for your righteousness. We know that we can't earn our salvation, but you gave it to us as a gift that we could be with you in, in paradise. And we know that we we struggle and we fail. And the Lord, let us continue to just cast everything upon you and, and be led by you and taught by you that, that you give us what we need and, and make us more like you, Lord. 
In your name we pray.